Thanks, everyone. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce three speakers who will lead our next presentation. In this presentation, panelists have been asked to share their experiences or reflect on how Indigenous knowledge has been or may be accessed from a researcher's perspective. So I'll introduce the three, and then each one will present, and then after, there'll be time for questions and comments. Our first speaker is Heather George, a scholar of Euro-Canadian and Ganyan Kehaga, or Mohawk descent. As Heather explains, growing up with her non-Indigenous grandmother, she had many opportunities to access Canadian history, but the stories she heard about her Mohawk ancestors were often negative. Perhaps because of this experience, much of her personal and professional work has been focused on gaining a better understanding of this culture and history. She completed an undergraduate degree at Trent University in History and Native Studies, and went on to pursue a diploma in Museum Management and Curatorship, as well as a master's degree in Public History. Uh, she's an overachiever, I think. Um, <laughs> Now, as a mother of a Cree Mohawk toddler and a PhD candidate, overachiever, um, Heather recognizes more than ever how important knowing history and having access to the beauty and brilliance of her indigenous knowledge is to healing colonial trauma. Heather's work seeks to challenge the colonial basis of cultural preservation methods and museology and question what we can learn from Haudenosaunee teachings and philosophies about how we engage with material culture to heal trauma. Our second panelist is Taylor Gibson. Taylor Liel Gibson Wahadedi Nagyaso, he's on a new road, is his name. Ganyede Niwasio'o de Turtle Clan, Geo Gohano Niwa Goe Jode, Cayuga Nation. Taylor is from Six Nations Canada, Haudenosaunee territory, and he's lived on the reserve most of his life and spent time learning from his grandparents. Taylor has attended Cayuga Immersion Language Program and is a supporter of the Indigenous culture and history. He has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in history and was the former assistant researcher at the Deohahage Indigenous Knowledge Center at Six Nations Polytechnic. Taylor is currently an archivist at Library and Archives Canada, and his passion is Haudenosaunee culture, history, and the Cayuga language. He currently resides on Six Nations territory with his wife and two children. Our third panelist, Skyly Storm Hogan, is a mixed ancestry urban indigenous person of Newfoundland and Kanawage, who was born and raised in the GTA. She holds an undergraduate honors degree in law from Algoma University and has worked professionally as an archive assistant, research assistant, and educational outreach coordinator for the Shingwalk Residential School Center from 2015 to 18. She is currently doing an MA in public history at Western University, and her areas of specialization are Canadian residential schools, academic and archival indigenization practices and accessible acquisition policy, contested history, and social media history and contemporary digital history. So we'll begin with Heather. Thank you. Um, Sego, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. I should say I only did one course in archival management, so um, I'm not an expert on that side of things, but hopefully I can give you some things to think about that will help you with your work. Um, so that was a really nice introduction, so thank you. Um, so I was born five years before Oka, um, and when I was growing up, um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, used to tell me not to tell uh, the kids that I went to school with uh, where my family is from because I would get beat up with, <laughs> with her words. Um, little did she know how much attitude I have, um, and I think I would have been just fine. But uh, growing up, the stories that I heard about what it meant to be uh, Haudenosaunee were not very good, uh, and what I accessed in museums was not great, and it wasn't until I went to Trent that I got to uh, see the sort of brilliance and beauty that is uh, our culture and our nations. 
So that's really why I do my research. And um, I was asked to speak a little bit about uh, what it's uh, like to be a researcher, Indigenous researcher in archives. And um, I was really fortunate this past week that I took a friend of mine to um, the Mohawk Institute uh, to Woodland Cultural Center, and I was explaining a little bit about my experience with this, and I had actually forgotten this story. So I wanted to share it with you. Um, the first archival research that I did was in my third year of my undergrad. And um, I had a professor who suggested that um, it would be really great if someone looked at uh, death records from uh, children in residential schools. Um, and so I thought very naively that that was something that I could do and do well. And because I was only in the third year of my undergrad, I also thought that history was objective, which we all know isn't true. Um, so I spent a year with uh, microfilmed records from RG10 um, that were improperly filled out for the most part um, and lacked a lot of detail um, and sometimes didn't record names, sometimes only numbers, um, and uh, I was not prepared to do that work. Um, so I read uh, record after record, hour after hour, sitting um, with a microfilm machine. Um, and uh, I didn't know the importance of self-care. Uh, so thanks for bringing Faith here, wherever you are, Faith. Thank you so much for being here today and to the organizers for having her here because I didn't realize at that point how important that self-care was as a researcher in this area. And when our research is so personal and so connected to who we are and to our communities and to our relatives, um, that all of the material that's in these collections, um, these are, you know, the material of real people. Um, it's, uh, although we talk about archival work as archival science, um, I think we have to be really careful not to forget that. Um, uh, another reflection that I had was um, a lot of research that uh, I've done is actually, uh, I did it in the Mohawk Institute itself uh, because that's where they had their uh, library. And so uh, the physical space that we are in when we're doing this work is also very important. And if um, it's a building like this, um, that might mean that we need to make uh, space uh, for people um, to have ceremony, to, uh, for example, maybe uh, burn sage or tobacco or whatever that is, we need uh, that space. Um, and so I think that's really important. Being in the Mohawk Institute is a really difficult space. My family went there um, and often there are school tours when you're there and so it's very loud and noisy and it's a very oppressive space to begin with and so that's not super enjoyable. Um, and that was something that I thought was important for people to know about. Um, also, I've had the experience of archivists as gatekeepers. Um, you're in positions of authority over the information that was often extracted from our communities um, and not always done in, uh, from a good, uh, a good perspective, right? Some of the work that was done in our communities uh, was not done by people who were really culturally knowledgeable, a lot of the work, in fact, um, as Taylor will probably talk about later, uh, and that creates uh, some problems with the way that the material is portrayed, um, but also um, in uh, who owns the material and uh, who gets to charge us money for our material to be digitized, um, or who has copyright over the material. These are all concerns uh, that sort of I was thinking about in this. Uh, most recently, we went to see um, the Decker Collection, which is uh, held in Rochester. And so to do that, we had to travel to Rochester, which of course meant uh, you know, our vehicle costs, and we pay, uh, We stayed in Rochester there. Um, so that had costs associated with it. Um, and so all of these things sort of add up when really we're accessing material that has come from our own communities. Um, so I, I did want to say, please don't think of us as victims or pity us. Um, we're still here. <laughs> and I always, 
and think how grateful I am to uh, our grandmothers and our grandfathers who didn't give up and who kept going. And because of that, we are still here to be able to pick up those pieces that have been very scattered. So um, one of the sort of questions that I always think about, and I do this for myself a lot because uh, my mom is uh, non-Indigenous, so I don't have a clan. Um, and that comes to my baggage. So I always think, why, why am I doing this work? And am I the best person to do this work? Is my organization the best place to do it? Right now, I'm a research assistant at De Ojahage, so I don't have to ask that question, which is really nice. Um, but uh, you know, what, uh, what resources do we need to have to support? Uh, even at De Ojahage, if people are coming in, what resources do they need and what kind of support does that person um, have? Uh, work with computers regularly? You know. We're really excited to digitize material, but sometimes that's not the best uh, access point for people who are coming into our organizations. So, ah, my next question. Uh, so are we colonizing or continuing to colonize knowledge? So how does our language and methodology of archival science create barriers for indigenous people? And who are we designing uh, these collections for? What are the priorities of the community that we work with? So I ask myself again, are we trying so hard to be a science that we're forgetting the humanities side of our work? Um, I think with the work that we're doing, we really have to balance these approaches and our, especially when I think about things like conservation standards. So um, because my background is more in museum work, uh, the first time I went to the Great Law Recital, um, they brought out uh, wampum belts. And they encouraged people to touch them. And of course, my like museum training brain freaked out and thought, where are the white gloves? Um, and then I realized that that was, I had been taught a colonial approach to indigenous material culture. And my immediate reaction was to think, oh, we need to do this in this way. But what was actually more important was for community members not just to witness and view the material, but to actually handle it, because that is part of the, the story and the beliefs and the cultural systems that exist around wampum. And that is more important than it lasting for the next 500 years. We need to interact with the material more than we need to focus on that conservation standard that we always are aiming for. Um, because the reality is, if the living cultures uh, are oppressed by our conservation standards, then we're failing in our work. Right? We want living cultures. We don't want cultures behind glass. Um, what else did I put on there? Yeah, OK, I think that covers that. There's a little bit about language, but there, I know that Sarah's going to talk a little bit more about that later on, so I won't cover that too much. But also just, you know, we have all these very discipline-specific terms, and those create barriers um, in the class, even the class ITA with Taylor. There, this is a barrier for our students to understand what these hierarchies mean. And so are there better ways of people understanding that? And, OK. So relationship is everything. Um, and I'm so glad that uh, Alan's presentation talked about relational terms and the importance of relationship. Um, I've been really fortunate to work um, in wonderful uh, relationships. Um, and the relationships that I've gotten to work in uh, have allowed sorry, that text you can just ignore the bottom part of it because it's a repeat, um, have allowed me to see that there, everybody brings something to the table when it comes to relationship. And often what I find with non-Indigenous organizations is that the thing that they do really well is write the grants and administer the grant and do all the paperwork. And um, Naomi and I had a great conversation earlier about administration and how much time that takes. And that takes us away from the cultural learning and the working with elders and all the work that we as Indigenous folks working in this field need to be able to do because we're the best at that. But if we're spending a lot of time on the administration side of things, we don't have the time to do that. And so it falls on the non-Indigenous organizations really to do that support work. Um, and a really great example, uh, I worked on a project called Discovering Ganada, and that was a project done between um, Six Nations, uh, well, really Chiefswood National Historic Site and the uh, City of Niagara Museum. Um, and they wrote the grant, they 
booked all the programs, they looked after all the financial end of things, and so my job was really to go out into community and find people, knowledge holders, to develop the educational materials we were working with, and that was wonderful. So um, there's an archivist that I think you should all uh, look up because his work is amazing. Uh, his name is Dr. Mike Jones, and he's from Australia. And he says that archives have uh, potential to become listening places, places where trauma survivors are not only treated empathetically, but where they're guided and supported through the process of discovering and accessing evidence. And that evidence is not just research. It can be key to their identity. It can prompt reconciliation and reconnection with lost family members. It confirms doubted memories of the past. This is really important, of course, with residential school material, but really any material. Um, and it also provides sought after evidence required to seek justice, for example, in our land claims work. So the work that we're talking about is incredibly important work. Um, it has current impl implications. This is not just work of the past. Um, so, um, I also wanted to get a little bit to these ideas. So these ideas around self-determination, um, cultural patrimony, so like community ownership of knowledge, and how that uh, is implicated in the work of archives. I'm not an expert on copyright law by any means, but I think it's really important that because we work in these institutions and because there are some of you out there who probably are experts on copyright law, um, that we understand that Canadian copyright law is an infringement on Indigenous communities and our rights to collectively owned knowledge and that the knowledge that was extracted from our communities now falls under this really strange area of copyright. So if you were a researcher and you did research in our communities and you took that material and put it into a collection, does that now mean that the community doesn't own it anymore? Well, under copyright law, probably. But are Indigenous people subject to Canadian copyright law? Philosophically, no. <laughs> um, Self-government would include our ability to control our own records um, and what methods that we used for this in the past would guide our work and should guide our work. Um, and I think does so in Indigenous organizations. Uh, when it comes to non-Indigenous organizations, these are still questions that need to be dealt with and addressed. Um, you know, there's a lot of responsibility behind the, this material. So is it the right time of year to discuss it? Um, what language is being used to discuss it? Is it ceremonial language um, or is it common language? Um, so all of these things need to be asked when we do our work. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that there are people in the audience who are more expert um, in this area um, that can kind of discuss this afterwards uh, amongst yourselves and think about how this works. But one of the things that I'd really like to see from the community of archival workers and also like the whole entire gallery, library, archive, museum community is that please, please, please magnify our voices. So our organizations are quite small. Um, we don't always get invited to the table when it comes to lobbying government um, for funding or for changing copyright laws or all of that stuff. So please, when developing these relationships, it's not just about a project. It's about this bigger uh, philosophical understanding of our fields and how we change the laws that guide our work. Um, because that's part of our responsibility as well working in these fields is to change our discipline and to move it forward and to move it away from the colonial framework that it was established under. So um, I did put up there this idea of cultural patrimony that comes out of NAGPRA and is used as one of their categories for um, repatriation. And that's again this idea of communal ownership of material. The wampum belts are a really good example of that um, when they were removed from our communities or sometimes um, sold. So the squiggly one there, um, that's called the Pledge of the Crown. Um, and uh, for example, that was pawned by Pauline Johnson to finance one of her trips to England. And it didn't just belong to Six Nations. I think it was 
50, I'm looking at Alan to try and confirm this, 50, I think, anyway, a lot. All of the nations that were allies of the British in the War of 1812 were presented with this belt um, in 1815. And uh, Pauline Johnson pawned it and was unsuccessful in one of her trips and so was unable to uh, get it back. Uh, and so she didn't really have the right to do that. This belonged to multiple nations, not even just her own nation. Um, and so these types of materials that are in our collection, we can't really see ourselves as owning them. Um, Non-Indigenous institutions are stewards of this material. Uh, you're holding the material. And I don't care what copyright law says, you don't own it. Uh, it belongs to community. Um, so help lobby that. <laughs> um, and then I put a little bit about self-determination in there. So we are in an era of discussions between communities and government and reflecting on the Indian Act and how it has impacted our communities and how our communities can move forward with self-determination. It's very, very complicated and messy and community by community. Um, and it's an ongoing dialogue. But within that, there's some really good guiding principles. So FPIC, uh, which is Free Prior Informed Consent, uh, which comes out of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Canada is a signatory to now, not originally. Um, those principles, I think, can help to guide our work. So free, prior, and informed consent when it comes to research um, and work with our communities. And then OCAP, which actually comes out of the First Nations Information Governance Center. Um, OCAP stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. And both of those, uh, because I'm in sort of the academic world, uh, get referred to a lot when it comes to research that's being done with, by, uh, for Indigenous communities. Um, but I think that they're principles that can be applied uh, in our field as well. So sort of, how am I doing for time? Good, okay, perfect, that's perfect. Um, so kind of wrap it up. Final thoughts, yay. Um, so uh, indigenous knowledge has never existed in silos and it still doesn't. And so I think how lucky I am when I get to go out um, with Derek, for example, and he's working on our project to like make corn pounder, right? And and when I work with Sarah and Tannis and Taylor and we plant a garden, and so our, our knowledge is applied knowledge. It is not just uh, a library or a gallery or a museum or an archive, uh, it's, or, or the land, it's all of those things in one. And so within the province and within the nation, um, we do need to do a better job of collaborating. So for example, the Ontario Museum Association is having their conference right now, which I go to present at tomorrow, but this is day one of that conference. So I'm putting the pitch out there. It'd be really nice to have a super conference. Um, so uh, Alan mentioned ATOM, so the Association of Tribal Libraries, Archives and Museums does an annual conference. It's primarily attended by Indigenous folks working in the field. Um, and anybody in this audience who's been there, you know it's so uplifting to see this work being done um, and led by community, but to have everybody there in one room is also amazing. And I think our disciplines are at that point. Many of us probably work in organizations where there is an exhibit space and an archive and a library, right? So even though we, our disciplines got pulled apart for training purposes, really we need to think about them as working together. And I think we need to do more of that. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so we need to practice the knowledge, not just write about it. So like get out on the land and do these things, which Taylor will talk about more, I'm sure. I hope you will, <laughs> throwing it out there. Um, and then the other thing is that um, projects need to be directed by community, and community needs to direct the research priorities. Um, so one thing I have found a lot in the work that I've done is that um, uh, a researcher or an institution will see a grant opportunity, and of course it will target Indigenous uh, community work or Indigenous knowledge, and then they will reach out to community and say, I've got this great idea. Which is like great and it's really nice and thank you for at least making that consideration but really what should happen is that relationship needs to exist before the grants come up and you need to be in dialogue with community about what their priorities are so we know 
that there's material in institutions that we would like to see digitized. Or we know that there are elders in our community who are getting, you know, they're getting on in age and those are the people that we should be speaking to. Um, or we know that we want our kids to be out practicing these things on the land. So develop those relationships now and make those a lifelong commitment between your organization and you as an individual and the people in community. And then when the grant opportunities come up, you can contact us and say, hey, remember five years ago we were talking about this? Because it does take that long. Um, here's a grant opportunity. Can we administer this for you? Can we do the legwork? We'll get you to review it. We'll submit it. We will write all the reports and the annoying stuff, and then the work that you want to see done in your community will get done. Um, so that's sort of my final comment. I probably, I hope I used my time well. Um, the wampum belts are here, and maybe at the end we can, when we're all together, we can talk a little bit more about them. But thank you so much for your time, and uh, hopefully you can change some things in the discipline. Thanks. Ah, that's easier. Now, scanners, we go. I will have any gas or gonna have any gas or there. Go on your comments or there. Uh, was vegan eat keep drunk. Uh, again, doga and governor gate. Nate was only got to know this and that to a tada. They got to me. I saw got a real start. Nate, I got a corner. Then got some car. I got a gang what hand. Nate, we go. Nay, I saw got a real start. They got to me. Scanners for the cartoon. They can name the canon young gates. Forget it. They can. <laughs> so just, uh, just very happy, very, <laughs> very happy to be here today. Uh, just introduce myself again. Uh, so my English name is Taylor Gibson. I'm from Six Nations. And yeah, so my presentation is on accessing the archive. So I should tell you too about what I said, yeah. <laughs> So I just said I'm very thankful to be here today. I send greetings to your ancestors, to your children, to your families, that they may be in perfect peace when you uh, return back to wherever you come from. And I also said that I'm just learning the language. It, it, but if you, under, if you understand it, I'm just learning. But if you don't understand it, everything's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, all right. So yeah, well, I'll just tell you a little bit about me. So like I said, I'm, or well, Rebecca said, I grew up at Six Nations. Um, so a lot of the people that we learn from is like uh, my teachers. So I went, I went to elementary at Isle Thomas. Uh, it was a very unfortunate time because a lot of the people there were first language speakers and they had a lot of old knowledge. And so one of the tricks that we'd always do is that uh, if we get them talking, we don't have to do any schoolwork. So get them to tell stories. And so that's what we'd be doing. Like sometimes it'd be like our uncle or something that comes in and he'd be like our substitute teacher. And that was the trick, get them to tell stories. You don't have to do any schoolwork. And so, yeah, so he told us a lot of stories. We, we kind of got what we asked for because he would tell us some really scary stories. And uh, just keep me, keep me awake for nights. Anyways, so yeah, we had a, I was very fortunate uh, growing up in that time because we had so many older people and they would always be telling us different things. So for my little agenda I got here for today, I have to say too, like I, <laughs> it was an adventure to get here today. Oh, that traffic, I got stuck on that steel street and like, I didn't think I was going to be here today. <laughs> Anyways, so like, as an indigenous researcher, so I used to work at Six Nations Polytechnic for a while, for quite a few years. I was pretty good. I had good times, good memories, as well as a lot of different things that I learned, as well as like presenting and everything like that. Um, so like some of the things I kind of come across that I thought was very important was like awareness, accessibility, and then I'll tell you a good example of when all the stars align and what I'm talking about, and that's the wall collection project. So I just got like a, some very basic questions, like awareness on indigenous col uh, collections within your archives. So for the archivists and the institutions out here, uh, are you aware of all the indigenous collections within your archives? And then how have you been outreaching to, your, to the communities that are related to those archives? Because I find that when I was researching, like we'd be familiar with some of the more famous people in our <laughs> histories, like William N. Fenton, uh, Mario Sparbo, and then you got Alexander Golden Weiser, or Sally Beaver. But you would miss a lot of different other people too if you weren't familiar with us. And what I'll get to in a bit is the wall collection. I'm really excited for that. Like, I, I can't wait to talk you, tell you about that. Anyways, so that's what I find is like awareness is very important. 
and making people aware of what you have in your collections. Because sometimes you can't wait for people to contact you. Sometimes you have to get out there and you have to start contacting these communities, let them know what you have. And sometimes they might be at different places. You know, Some communities, they're still fighting to have good water. Even in the nine communities, Six Nations, we're still fighting to have good water. But at the same time, though, we have people that look after it, and we also have people to look after like our culture and language and everything that we're kind of very diverse. We're very lucky at Six Nations, very fortunate. Anyways. So yeah, that's what I had to say about awareness. Like, there's not too much to say other than uh, trying to make people more aware of what you have. And then accessibility. Oh, that's like a big issue too. So accessibility, I find, is if you have if your institution is way, is located more than a day's drive from the community, that's going to be an issue to bring people in to come look at the material that you have. And that's usually a huge issue is trying to access this material. And if you don't have anything digitized and you have to go there, that's going to be a big problem, I find. Especially if you have, like, the researchers have children or families and things like that, it's, that's time away from them, it's really hard. And a lot of these things are just kind of barriers. And what Heather had said about copyright laws, I won't say what institution. Uh, so I was trying to access this one uh, document. And it turns out they didn't even have ownership of this. And so they couldn't even give me permission. So I had to go find a third party. And uh, they didn't even know they had that copy. And so we went, I went to this other institution. And they said, oh, we don't have that permission either. And so they direct me to this other place. So I had to go through three different things. And there was also this little document that talked a little bit about Six Nations. Not even very much. Nothing really like damning or anything like that. It was just it was just a little, little brief report about the, the state of residential schools, like uh, the Mohawk Institute. Like it didn't say anything bad or anything like that. It was just how the school was run or something. And um, I found like it took about almost like six months just to get that access to that copy. And it was like uh, the person who originally requested it from me was actually like a residential school survivor. And so that was like a huge issue just to get her that document or that audio file. And it took like almost forever to get it. And so I had to keep at it. And that's one of the things I learned from work at archives is that you have to keep on them every day. <laughs> you have to send emails every day, every day, just to keep bugging them, just to keep it in their ears or keep it in their minds of um, we need this, we need this, we need this document or we need this audio file. So anyways, again, like creating access, like that's something to think about for your collections as well too, is how do you create access for communities who are far away and they don't have time to come to your uh, institution or anything like that. Again, these are just barriers I find, especially with copyright laws. So <laughs> here's like the exciting thing. I, like here's what I enjoy talking about the most. I think is the wall collection. So when I was talking about uh, awareness and barriers, um, so I'll tell you a little story. Uh, so when I was working at the Indigenous Knowledge Center, we had gotten a visit um, some from, some folks from the American Philosophical Society. Uh, we had uh, the archivist there, Brian Carpenter, and then the, we had the late Timothy Pollockan. And so they, we had this little meeting. It, was, it went really good, and it was it was just really nice. And so anyways, they left and we didn't think too much of it. And here, they sent us an invitation to come down there and do some research, look into their collections. And so it was really good. Like, it was a good trip. Um, we were, the main thing that we were looking for is the Frank G. Speck collections. And so after we had completed our research trip, they gave us this little disc. Oh, I should ask too, I should add too that we actually met Marge Bouchak out there too. <laughs> and uh, she taught me a little tidbit about like, uh, well, reading some of the hard cursive that you'd find in this historical documents is to make these alphabets. So that's something I still use to this day. <laughs> Anyways, so we got out there and so they gave us this disc at the end of it. It was like this disc of all these stories in there. And there's about 157 stories in this wall collection. I'd never heard of this person named Wall before. I'd never heard of this collection or anything like that. We had no idea you know, what, was going, what we were going to stumble across. And uh, like the nature of our work at the Indigenous Knowledge Center, it takes about when you get something like that, you usually you got so much other things going on, it takes about a year or so just to look at something that was given to you. And so I started going through it, and uh, I was looking for the language. That's what the, was the main thing I was looking for in that collection. I was trying to find any language that was in there. And so I got to about the 12th story in, and I started reading it. And I was like, wait a second, there's, the, there's, there's more to these stories. And I realized that there were, like, the storytellers were embedding knowledge within these stories. So they weren't just stories, but they were actually tidbits of information, but you had to know how to read them. That was like the other thing. And I think it was like later that year, after I finished exhausted reading all those stories and documenting the language that was in there, uh, Tim, Tim Cam, or Timothy Pollockam, he came uh, back to our community. And uh, he started talking, uh, asking about questions about it. And so I told him about some of the stuff that we were finding. And he got blown away by it because he said, well, when I read it, I thought they were just stories. And then I was explaining different things to him that were contained in those stories. 
it un unlocked a lot of different information for him. So he got, got to work right away and said, I'm going to write you the grant. And so one of the biggest things that we had to do was try to locate where this collection was. We didn't know where it was. Until I started looking at this, uh, so Wall, or Frederick Wilkerson Wall, he published a book in uh, 1916 called The Iroquois Food and Preparations. And so in the community there, if you go to Iroquois, that's where like, one of our big bookstores are. And so they have these Iroquois reprints. And so they look like, they kind of look like a dime a dozen books there. And uh, they're all the same. And so I, I picked it up and I looked at it and I got to the back and I realized there's pictures and there's names of these people in there as well too. So I tried to go through it to see where this was located. And here it was located at the Canadian History Museum in Ottawa. So he wrote us this grant and then we actually made it out to Ottawa just last year. And uh, it was really big for us. Like we thought at first maybe it'll just be like, uh, there might be some photos, there might be like a notebook or here and there. And uh, so when I contacted the archivist out there, his name is Benoit Thoreau, He's, he just kind of said, no, there's lots. You have to come here and see. And a lot of that stuff wasn't digitized either. And the other thing that we kind of found out when, I, when we got there was that uh, one of the anthropologists, William N. Fenton, had come like sometime in the 40s, collected this, all these notebooks, and he held on to them to the 1980s. And that's when he finally returned back to the Canadian History Museum. So it limited a lot of the uh, access towards like accessing this collection. Like It was a huge thing. And uh, it was just kind of like a shock to hear that, like somebody would hold on to all this information. Like if we had gotten this like maybe about 10, 20 years ago when we had a lot more older people, this would have been really good to have. You know, so as like people are passing on now, the pool of people that you can consult with this stuff is slowly dwindling. And now we only have the people that, um, like we only have their stories now, what they, could, what they taught us and everything like that. I find that's something that's still kind of like a sore spot a little bit. But anyways. Frederick Wilkerson, Wall, 1872 to 1924. And, uh, oh my God. <laughs> if you could see this collection, it's huge. So not only is there textual documents, there's actually a large photographic collection, as well as uh, material culture as well. It's a huge collection. We have just normally thought it was just norm like notebooks, but no, it was just expanded. And it was huge. And the other thing I have to add to that, uh, he had a mysterious disappearance in 1924 out near Ganawage. So he never actually got to publish any of his work other than that uh, 1916 uh, Iroquois Food Preparations. And I started learning more about him as well too. And what I learned was that he was actually uh, from Langford, Ontario, which is a stone throw, throw away from uh, Six Nations. So he's pretty local. And that the other thing is that he used to work here in Toronto. Uh, he was a furniture magazine editor. And I guess they caught wind of Edward Sapir, the head of um, the National Geolog Geolog Geological Survey, the Anthropolog Anthropological Division. And he hired him to come do research at Six Nations to look at the uh, technology, to study technology and take notes and everything like that. And he did a really amazing job. Like there's just so much information that's in there. And yeah, so when he came in 1911 to 1918, he studied like the Grand River, but also he didn't just limit to Six Nations, uh, Six Nations community, but also like uh, Onondaga, New York, Tanawanda, Oneida, a little bit of Ganawage, like he studied everywhere. Lakso, um, I think you believe he went even to Manawaki and Lab Labrador. So he studied like the collection is like huge. But the work that's, that's I'm mainly interested in is the, is the work he's done at Six Nations. And uh, so this photo here is like Tanning Heights uh, by David Jack. So the, you get a little sample of everything that's in there. So you get like the material object that's sitting in the Canadian History Museum. You have the photograph of him step-by-step step, how to tan hides, and then you get the uh, recipe right here. Oh, did I, have, did I include that one? Oh, here, it's everything. So that's the step-by-step step on how to tan hides at Six Nations. And I have to tell you, like, that's something that's really kind of fall, fallen by the wayside at Six Nations. We're not really doing that anymore. We're still doing a lot of hunting, but we're not tanning the hides anymore. And so that's one of the things that how these collections can help us. And it's just a really amazing because that's something that's happening right now in our community. It's like it's not uncommon to hear like gunshots because people are hunting all, like all throughout the day. And what are they doing with their hides? I don't know. So that's something that we can consider as well too in terms of revitalization is to look at this archival material. And then I think it's going to have to do a lot of uh, trial and error that we're going to have to relearn these stuff again as well. And so this is how it can help us. And it has step by step as well the photographs that go with it as well. That's why I thought it was pretty pretty interesting. And uh, I wanted to include, like, because the collection is so huge, and uh, I did a presentation on this at the Iroquois Research Conference uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so one of the people that I'm collaborating with at the Canadian History Museum now is uh, Talina Atfield. She works at the Ethnology Department in there. 
And uh, so it's been really good like we're having this collaborative relationship and we're working together. I should, I should also add that she's Mohawk. And she has the roots at Six Nations. And then uh, the other thing too that we're finding is like these are just small samples because like I could sit here and talk about this all day. And like <laughs> if I had the time, I would. And uh, so one of the things that we found in there was storytelling customs. And so this is by a fellow named John Echo who was on Dog a Deer. Uh, I wanted to include his photo, but there's not enough time. And so he's talking about some of the stories, uh, a guy again, like here's my story, uh, to tie it with a knot. So these are old phrases that he used to use for storytelling. And there's another thing in here too I wanted to tell you. And so, wait, where is it? Okay. So you see that he hate, maybe you'll see it better in this one. So there's another, there's a, so here, here it is again too. Um, John Jameson Jr. talked about it in 1915 as well too, storytelling. So they said like a long time ago, people would get together and uh, they would, they'd get all the old people up and whoever was the best storyteller, they would pass a hat around and people would throw gifts for the old storyteller. And so if the story got really good, they would stop and pause for a minute and then they'd pass that hat around again. <laughs> so the, in order to actually get your, uh, finish the story, you know, you had to kind of pay up. So anyways, so the other thing that was kind of interesting in there too is this he hit and so I was talking to one of my relatives there, and so I was asking him, you know, do you, are you familiar with that? And he said, uh, oh, but what it kind of sounds like to him, it said it was why, and that's what uh, he said. So it's something that they would say when the storyteller would begin, because it says in there too, like, if the storyteller didn't hear that, he would just go home. And, they, and he, like, yeah, that was like, kind of like their acknowledgement. Anyways, so I asked this other elder, uh, our other elder there, and he said, like, uh, I haven't heard of that one, but I heard of he hit. And uh, I go, what does that mean? He goes, that means, that's bullshit. <laughs> they said, don't ever say that to somebody you don't know, though. <laughs> Only if you know that person, then you can say that. But it's like if the storyteller, or I guess if the story wasn't good, you would say t hat. <laughs> but there's this that kind of information that's in there. Right? And uh, again, this is only scratching the surface. Like originally, when we went to the Canadian uh, History Museum, we were hoping just to find like these stories. Maybe they're written in the language, maybe they weren't. I had really high hopes that they were written in the language. But it turns out they're written in English. But there is some stories, there's at least two stories that I can confirm that is written all in the language. In 1914, there's one by John, uh, Peter John, all in Onondaga. It's about 12 pages, just full Onondaga. And it's not translated. So that's some more work that can come back to our community in this translation. The other thing that's in there too is uh, this Oneida creation story by uh, Anthony Day, who's a Oneida chief at the time. And he had all this information there, and it's, all, it's translated as well too. So you have like, I don't know, it's about 10 pages all in Oneida as well as translate it. And that's the other thing that I find is real interesting with these translations is like, how did they translate it at that time? What was the meaning for that at that time? Because you'll see like, there's so many different words in there too. Like, so was really good at documenting the language. Like, so it'd just be little tidbits of information. Like, for example, one of the words in there was like, so was. And that's something you hear a lot growing up. That just means like a word for dog. But he wrote down the little translation of that. It means like the mouth hanging open. <laughs> so like you can see like in my community anyway you can see a lot of so it's like people hanging out with their mouth open <laughs> so like no it's like really good though like um, just finding these little details you know these little pieces of information are so helpful and it's also like piecing together all these little pieces and then that's when you get that clear image of what he was trying to do and I have to add as well too that this is uh, so in 1924 uh, just the year he passed away that's when the elected system had come into Six Nations. And so that's a huge issue. It's still a huge issue. But uh, with this collection, you get at least a snapshot of what that last decade was like underneath like the hereditary chiefs, like the sole government at Six Nations at the time was the hereditary chiefs. So you get tons of photographs. You get the, I don't know, it's, if, to me, I felt like you're really like meeting some relatives. And it's like you're going to go sit with this person for a little while and you get to sit and listen to what they were trying to say. And I find that it's really interesting is the way they wrote uh, those stories down. Like he wrote it as the way it was translated to him because he had hired um, this other fellow named John Jameson Jr. from the other, oh, from that one there. So he hired him as what they call an informant, but I think they like to call him as a participant now. And he would be providing him with translations. And the other thing I thought that was really interesting with this is that he wouldn't just take one person's word for it, but actually go talk to a group of other people as well too. And he would actually um, write down, like if somebody said something different, so he'd compare like the different, uh, translations are different bits of information. And the other thing that was really good in it as well too, is that he actually wrote down the women's names. You don't really see that too often. He actually wrote down, well, sometimes we get like Mrs. Peter John or Mrs. Peter Jack, or Mrs. David Jack, sorry. But other times you'll see like Miss Lydia Sugar and you'll get like these other names in there too. That's just amazing that for the time anyway, that he was actually recording the names and who said what and where and different things like that.
And he actually wrote down like for the photographs as well too. This is a this is an amazing collection. So like so some of the ongoing work that we got going on here. Uh, so one of the things I've been I did when I was there is I started taking photos. Uh, so they allowed us to take photos just with our phones because like sitting here trying to get like digitizations of these notebooks is huge. So I, for, we had two days there and I took about 2,500 photos. I just took nonstop and just like we'll read it after. Photo, 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 photo. And so I, I started uh, reorganizing this notebook through digital form. And I found like, uh, so in 1915 alone there's 15 notebooks. These are about 60 pages each. And so I've just been transcribing and I've actually completed that. And then the other one was 1918, which is something I'm still, I'm still ongoing and still working on. And there's about nine notebooks in there as well too. So I'm like, I'm on six now. So I'm getting there. <laughs> can see the light of the tunnel. Uh, again, like the other thing that we're trying to do as well is try to identify these stories that are in the APS collection, or from the APS collection, or the American Philosophical Collection. Because he has these edited versions that are all typed up. But what I've been finding is that they're actually not, they're actually very different. And the language that you find in there is, <laughs> it's more like, you can tell it's somebody from my community talking or telling him this stuff the way he wrote. You know, it's not grammar, it's not perfect grammar or anything like that. It's just, it's just how like our old people talked. And like you can see those phrases, even like the English phrases that they use, they still, some of our older people still use those kind of phrases. Again, there's additional notebooks to be completed. Like, so the other thing is, so 1915 and 1918 was probably the bulk of the stuff, but there's still 1911, 1912, 1917. There's, so much information in there. And the other thing that we've been, or I've been finding was that there's actually a huge volume of information about uh, plants and medicines, which is extremely important <laughs> for our community. And just to see this, this volume of information that nobody has been talking about or writing about too much, like I've, I've made some about two articles on them so far, but it's just like this volume of work. And I remember asking some of uh, my relatives if they ever heard of them before and some researchers, they said, no, nobody's ever really heard of them before. And so like just to find stumble, kind of stumble across this huge collection and what it can mean for our communities. Oh, so the other thing that's going on too, uh, kind of on to Lima's end is that she's digitizing some of the photographs from that collection. And so one of the things that we hope to do is uh, create accessibility for these uh, uh, notebooks. For me, like it's not really important to have those notebooks. It's just stuff I don't, I don't, I don't have like the space for that kind of thing. Like I just need the information that's in there. That's what's important to me anyway, is the information that's contained in those notebooks. If we can have it transcribed, that's perfect. I don't need to have that because I know it has to have room temperature and everything like that. And you know, if you want to preserve it for long, that's fine. Like for me, I could see like maybe that's his property, but at the same time, though the information is kind of like our property. And so that's the thing that's kind of more, I'm more interested in is just the information that it contains rather than the actual physical book. I mean, it would be great to have for like our little museum, but you know, like again, I'm pretty happy with just with the information. And then, so the other thing too is trying to create awareness in the collection as well too. Uh, going to um, having little small, group, uh, small chats with some of our older people, let them know like what, what's in there. I think I, when I returned back from this collection, uh, from this trip, we had, they had a soup meeting in there. Uh, Polytech there, and uh, so I, <laughs> I kind of like uh, kind of made a, made a blender there. What Alan had said about if you, you can burn some of these old people out by showing every little detail. But I had this the, these unorganized notes because like uh, I had to go when I got back, I had to put everything back together. But it was just like every new page was just full of information, and it just created all these like racing thoughts. Like it was just like so much information that it was just hard to kind of comprehend taking all this stuff in. Like you had to go sit down and walk for a while, or just go think about everything. And at the same time, they'll be like super excited for like this information that you're finding and this you want to share with everybody. <laughs> Anyways, so the other thing that we hope to do with this is like create revitalization, um, culture, language, traditional knowledge. There's tons of that stuff in there. How to make things like fishing nets, for example, uh, how to make traps, uh, how to make canoes, bows, everything like that. And the other thing too is a lot of the stuff was collected from our, our folks at uh, Six Nations and it's housed at the uh, Canadian History Museum. So again, putting it, putting it into hands of our artisans to recreate this, you know, that's the thing, I, the, the kind of ideal goal I see is it's like kind of revitalizing like an economy as well too for our people that, you know, they can engage in our culture as well as try to make a living as well too, I think. And the other thing that you, we're gonna learn from it as well is that we have to be very conscious of our environment towards it because we can't exhaust everything. Everybody can't be making uh, ash uh, baskets because we're gonna have no more ash trees. And uh, so that's the other thing that's in there as well too, like how to make baskets, how to make moccasins, and like different styles of moccasins. This is all in there, I couldn't believe it. Like it's really like a huge find.
I don't know if I have anything else. So I think that's kind of kind of everything I could kind of talk about it. Like, because when I got back uh, from that conference, I had, so I had that class. I had about three hours to talk about this stuff, and like that three hours just flew right by. I had about sixty nine slides, <laughs> and so I could I made sixty nine slides fly by like it was nothing. Like those three hours were gone, just like that. And then like it was just like I don't know, it's just amazing. What it looks like at the end, I'm not too sure. But when I seen like the exhibition out there, the Animalia, that gets me excited because we have enough stuff to fill like something like that as well at Six Nations. I think that's something that we would like to do as well. Maybe on the later end of things is to create like a program where people can come learn this stuff and then they can get engaged in it as well too. And you know, that's what I like to think is like uh, when all the stars align and you have like these great collaborations, this is something that can come from it. So I think there's probably a lot more stuff I forgot to say, but <laughs> I think that's my time. So now that's what I'll see you. Thank you all for listening. Hello. <laughs> um, so my name is Skyly Storm. Um, I am originally from uh, Mohawk's Ganawage First Nation. Uh, it's where my father is from and where his family currently still lives. Uh, my mother's family uh, resides in Toronto, Ontario, but uh, they're originally, they trace their roots to Ireland, but for as long as they can remember, they've been in Newfoundland. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today a little less informally, like a little bit more informally, um, kind of about my experiences as a researcher. Because uh, I'm a little bit on the younger side. <laughs> um, I was born a couple years after the Yoka crisis. So similarly to Heather, um, turning out light encouraged my uh, non-Indigenous family to um, ask me to not look into those parts of myself. And that kind of driven uh, drove for me a passion to do more archival research into my history, my family's history, and kind of why that crisis happened and why we are where we are. Um, I had a lot of whys in my head as a child all the time. Um, my experience with research, though, started off in probably the best place it could have started off. Um, for my undergraduate degree, I was really interested in law. And that is something that is inherently built on history. And while I was doing that work, I was in Algoma University. So that is in Sault Ste. Marie, Bawating. So it's Anishinaabek um, and some would say Métis territory. And there I learned that the law was really interpreted only from one side. Uh, it didn't really have two sides to it, much as treaties we understand from what is written, which is in one side. Um, while I was there, I started working for the Shingwak Residential School Center, and my archival mentor was Kristen McCracken. And they work extensively with the communities of survivors, as well as the surrounding Indigenous communities that access the archives there. Um, I was very fortunate to start off in that place, because for me, that is what an archive should be. That is what an archive looks like when it's built around communities of people that it directly talks about and that it directly impacts. Uh, we worked directly with the residential school survivors almost on a daily basis. We worked with their families. Uh, collections that were held came from various places. And one of the first things that I realized with research experience is when I was almost in a position of power and a position of gatekeeping and it often made me uncomfortable. Uh, I was seeing people that I regularly went to classes with, attended feasts with, attended ceremonies with, come into that space, and then suddenly the dynamic of our relationship changed. And I realized that's because other archival institutions that existed outside of that space were set up in a way that intentionally put barriers in front of the material um, in the guise of preservation. Uh, the Shingwak Residential School Center, regularly we use uh, regular archival description uh, conventions, so like RAD, uh, we, we do do some conservation on artifacts, but we've started really looking at what the community wants from those records, what the community wants from that knowledge. And that was really what inspired me to kind of keep talking about that work. 
We had, for instance, many people doing research on their family who had attended the school and had also had attended schools in the local area, like Spanish, as well as Wakamakong. Um, and the experience of doing research in the Shingrock Residential School Center is a lot different than the experience of doing research in other places. I would be sitting there regularly. Um, one of my first jobs was changing archival description. Because a lot of the archival descriptive work that had been done in the early days of the residential school center was done by non-Indigenous people. And it would often continue and perpetuate the wording that was done in the records that really dehumanized the students and the people who were interacting with that space. So my job was kind of going through and reinterpreting those titles and those record series in a way that kind of brought a little bit more humanity into the equation. Um, but it wouldn't be uncommon for me to be sitting there and have, for example, we regularly worked with a survivor named Harvey Trudeau who would come in and with his wife and they would be speaking the language as they were doing their research. And while you were doing research there, it felt very communal. It felt like you were being supported. It felt like there were things available to you in that space. And while I was there, we actually set up a partnership with the Ontario Indian Residential School Survivor Support Services. And we had at all times a number on the side of our desk um, for people that we could call who were trained to respond to people who were having emotions to deal with their research or were having a moment of crisis. And they were really there to help us and to help the people who were engaging in that research. And going back to what Heather had said earlier, self-care when you're doing that type of research is extremely important because the things that you're going to be reading in those records, not even just from the students themselves, but from the administrators, is going to be incredibly difficult to deal with, especially if you've had family from those places. Um, now, I've had the experience where I've met people who are coming back to that space for the first time in about 35 years. And it's incredibly difficult for most people to understand what that is like. And especially when you're trying to do research on a part of you that was really taken from you and you had no agency in that situation. And it's really a, a time of reclaiming what, what should have been yours all along. Um, now, my, my research now, as myself, um, I actually, <laughs> my convocation's happening at the same time as this, and uh, I actually just got my master's degree today, which is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> it's very special to me because I'm the first person in my family to have something like that. I didn't really think that that was something that I would do. Uh, but for many of us who are in those spaces, we're often the only people there. Um, there's only one or two of us, maybe three. And doing research can be very isolating because while you're doing research, I went from doing research at the Shingwok Residential School Center to now living in Ottawa and doing research at Library and Archives Canada. And it's a very different experience. Um, you have to fill out forms day in advance. You have to have a special ID card around your neck at all times. Uh, you have to not keep the boxes open on the table or someone will come by and slam the box down and, and tell you sternly not to do that. Um, that was something that we never did at the Shingwok Center. Um, actually, we even had cases where people would come in and say, um, this is all of my father's art books and he was a really great drawer and he's not around anymore and we really wish we could have that art ourselves. And we were like, well, we've got hundreds of high-res digital copies. Uh, we've got all of the material that we need you can have them. Uh, we would regularly have elders come into the space who would say, you know, you have pipes in your collection, you have um, beadwork in your collection, you have medallions in your collection. These things should be cared for. These are things that once had spirit, that once had meaning to somebody who owned them. Um, this is how you should store them. This is how you should package them. Um, people should come in every now and then and feast these items. And Krista, being a really great ally of the communities in that area was just like, sure, of course, why not? And it's that, that willingness to adapt and that willingness to take in other ways of, of doing and of knowing that is extremely important, I feel, for the archival profession because 
when I was attending my master's at Western, you know, you learn about preservation, you learn about museology, you learn about archival practice from really one perspective, and that there's such an onus on preserving things. And I really loved what Alan said earlier, you know, you can preserve all of these things and keep all of these things, but without us, you're really not going to understand what these things are. Um, and I think that that is something very vital to keep in mind. Uh, now, working in research at Library and Archives Canada, it was funny because I took a look around and I saw more of our people in there than I expected to see. But then I kind of started critically thinking about that and realizing that because of the power structures that were in play and the fact that our lives were controlled in, in their entirety by a foreign government entity, that all of our records and everything about us was being held with them. And so as in terms of access, yes, you have to leave your community and you have to travel really far to access those things, as Taylor said, and that puts a very large barrier in between us doing that research and in between us getting those materials for what we need to bring back to our communities or what we need to understand about ourselves. And I think that's something that was very important about Shingwok was that it's located in a place where if there's still some accessibility issues, the Sioux isn't super close to, to all of the communities that are surrounding it, but it is close enough that people can access it from time to time and more on a regular basis. Um, now, being an Indigenous person who's working within an archive, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of times when people look at you to be the, the de facto source of knowledge on something when even you know, I'd have to explain, like, I'm not Anishinaabe. <laughs> I'm, I'm Haudenosaunee, like, I'm Mohawk. I, I, don't, uh, I don't really understand. Like, I, I can help you as far as I know from learning from other people, but I can't really teach you this in a way that really encompasses it in its wholeness. And I think that that's something important to consider as archivists. You know, if you have somebody who works with you who is Indigenous, don't look at them to be the the point person or the universal knowledge on everything, sure, you can ask them for like ask them some questions and look for other ways to get to resources or knowledges that you need, but that person themselves may not be the person who carries all of that knowledge with them. Um, now, I need, sorry. I think another important thing to look at too when engaging with with practices is the fact that these things really, really do intimidate uh, when you're asked, you know, you're, you're putting all of your bags and stuff in a locker, you're kind of like being watched and things like that when you're trying to access information that at times can be very hard for people who are reading it. And I feel that that's what's different about archives like Shingwok that are more Indigenous community centered is that you know, when somebody is just sees something that's really either interesting to them or heartbreaking to them or something that really has context for what they're looking for, they just they just share it with you while they're in the space and they just say, hey, you know what I looked at, what I just found, and they come over or you come over to the table and you start talking with them about it and you build this community connection, you build this understanding. Whereas somewhere like Black, it's like this, it's like dead quiet. <laughs> and if you start talking to your neighbor, you start talking to your friend, someone you're doing research with, people start to kind of give you that look like, shh. And that, that whole aspect of community and of context and of understanding is, is really stripped away and lost. Um, now, another interesting thing is that we look at pieces that have been taken and we look at pieces that are on display or that are held in holdings, similarly to wampum belts. But in the Shingwok Center specifically, while they were cleaning out the building, uh, because it's housed in the former Shingwok Residential School, while they were cleaning out the building, they found a lot of materials that had belonged to students. Um, former staff and administrators had also, their families had donated items that they had confiscated from students when they went into the schools. And something that we had realized is that the students came from so far and wide that it was almost impossible to track down where those items had come from. And so we started putting on display uh, beadwork and started asking local material culture 
engaged folks, like, you know, do you know what style this is? Do you know where this is from? We started putting them out and far and wide and kind of being like, do you recognize this? If you And our whole thing on the inside was like, if someone recognizes this as being theirs or belonging to their community, we really want to give it back to them because it was taken from them. And what actually ended up happening is we had lots of moccasins. We had lots of um, different beadwork charms. We had embroidery. Uh, we started having the local students come in who were in the Anishinaabe Moen program uh, who were also engaged in material culture and kind of a lot of that relearning, their research was interacting with these items and learning from these items different techniques or different ways of making um, these pieces that no longer that knowledge is held within their community. So they got to physically be in the space with them, they got to touch them, they got to take really good looks at them so they could recreate for themselves in their own styles some of that historical knowledge from the students that had been lost. And I think that more openness and the more community focused ideas of what archives should be, should be practiced more often. And I know that we have barriers within institutions, bureaucracy, um, things that prevent us from being as community minded or as equitable as we would like to be. However, I, I challenge us to be a little bit more brave and really ask for those things to be regular practices rather than just special events. Uh, because what I've noticed is that similarly to what Heather said about bringing in people for grants when grants come up, is that those partnerships should really exist all the time. And that was something that was really special about the Shingwak Residential School Center as well is that those partnerships were regular. We had survivors drop in on a daily basis. We had schools who brought their tour groups through. We were lucky to have a survivor that would regularly speak with us, Mike Kakaji, and he would come in and speak to the students almost on a weekly basis. And he would ask about certain pieces in the collection and what's going on with that and what are you doing with this? And these people were personally invested because this place was their home. And I think that that is something that we need to remember is that these aren't just artifacts. These aren't just records or pieces of a national history that we need to preserve. They're really snapshots from people's lives and really parts of people that have been removed from them that we need to return. And we do need to be stewards because we're all stewards of knowledge and we're all stewards of the land. And I think that that is something that we really need to reconnect with and understand, even from the point of research. Uh, so while I was kind of going through and renaming a lot of these documents and collections, you know, I had to take a lot of time for myself and I had to do a lot of reflecting because some of that research actually touched my family and, and touched ancestors of mine, as well as made a lot of the context of what my family could experiences very more apparent than it had been. And, you know, understanding that research for some people is very academic and very separated from the human element, but research for other communities is very personal and it's a journey of self-discovery and it's a journey of reconnecting. Um, so that's kind of my experience with research in itself. And currently, I'm working for a company called No History Historical Services, located in Ottawa. And I do research for a living still. And a lot of that is Indigenous community-based research. A lot of it is genealogical research. And a lot of what people send us, and I can see they send us documents that we can't necessarily use, but they're, they're family histories. They're, they're written down. They're collected meticulously by those by those grandmothers, by those uncles, by those aunties that really wanted to preserve the family history. And those things aren't counted as official. And it's really, it's really just that perpetuation of what the government deems to be factual and what archival institutions and what bureaucracy deems to be factual. And for us, that that's, that's really not the same thing. Uh, so it's really just, it's not so much as decolonizing because you can't really decolonize an institutional structure. It's just, that's the nature of it. Um, but it's reimagining and rethinking of how we can do these things in more equitable and more honest ways. And that's kind of what I wanted to leave you with. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Our caterer is conveniently delayed a few minutes, which gives us ample time to have a conversation with our three presenters. So I'd ask that they um, join us here at the front. And I'm happy to uh, take questions from either our in-person audience or our chat. And Jay will come around with a microphone. And this can be for you guys to answer. Awesome. Question at the back. Just before we answer that question, I wanted to say one thing I didn't say in my presentation. So uh, I hear this a lot. And when John did the introduction, he said uh, indigenous issues. And this is not to call out John. This is to call out everybody, because I bet you've all done it too. These are not indigenous issues. These are colonial issues that have been imposed on indigenous people. And so let's reframe the language that we use to acknowledge that the indigenous part is not the issue. That's it. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, so this is this question is for anyone, although I thought of it from Heather's slide about uh, trauma-induced glams. So if if archivists like know that they have a collection that um, has some stuff that could be traumatic, what do you think is like? Do you think archivists should inform people beforehand before they visit, and and how do you think? Um, so we deal with that a lot um, with residential school center archives, uh, just because a lot of the correspondence can be very traumatic because they're talking about student death or they're talking about um, students in very dehumanizing lights. Uh, what we try to do is there's a little disclaimer on the online description that says like some of this material may be uh, triggering or sensitive for certain individuals. And then we give the number of the residential school support hotline, uh, which is a 24 hour hotline that's directed at supporting people who are intergenerational or direct survivors of residential school experience. Uh, however, all you can really do is kind of put that information within the description, um, kind of like a disclaimer. Uh, other than that, if you're institution provides supports of some kind, those should be um, on standby when a researcher requests that material. Uh, but really, yeah, just communicating that some of that material can be really hard to digest is a, is a good starting point. I would also say like the physical space is really important. And I kind of mentioned that, but um, thinking about like, do you have Kleenex? Um, so uh, do you have, like, comfortable chairs that people can take a break? Is it easy to get outside um, from the space that you're going to be working in um, so that people can take a break and get fresh air? Like, the things that you would uh, look to in other, uh, I guess, like, trauma-informed approaches to work uh, and in therapy, I think those are things that we can start to adopt more into our own practices as well. Um, and that'll sort of help with that, too. Oh, yeah, definitely, because I think it's like if it's really traumatic, and I think it's also if it's like it's showing somebody a graphic photo, right? Like you would want to give them warning or anything like that, right? Just so that they know. <laughs> so they're not just like uh, just totally blindsided by something that could, you know, could could weigh on them, like make them feel really heavy. Because I find sometimes when you can see some of that material, it makes you feel like a certain way, like, like, like it's like the weight has fallen on you for some reason. And then, you know, it takes a long time just to get that weight off you and because uh, you absorb some of that information that's in there. And then it just affects your mind the way that you think and everything like that. So I think definitely like a disclaimer, even if you've gone through it, just to let the person know like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'd like to thank Kaylee for uh, the point she made, particularly um, at the end when you were talking about um, being aware of the meaning and the power of what people are reading and the impact on them. Uh, and I think this is really um, a key thing for archives to take away, that they're not just handing out, you know, box 32 of RG10, it's they're handing out um, information which could potentially have that impact on people. So it, to me, it calls on archivists um, to put a new layer um, of awareness into their service that um, 
I mean, we can identify um, particularly Indigenous collections, but there are other occasions in which this will be true too, that you really have to think this isn't a mechanical, uh, I mean, this comes out of our mechanical Western way, non-emotional way of dealing with information and knowledge. Uh, and so, you know, while our society is in many ways based on that, we need to at least add to it um, an understanding of what potential meaning our collections have for people and therefore of, of their impact. And we have to be ready to deal with that in our reading rooms. The other thing I wanted to point out really quickly because I didn't get to talk about these is the wampum belts. So there's the two row Gaswenta that probably most people are familiar with. Um, Pledge of the Crown, Dish of One Spoon, uh, and that friendship belt down there. So although in some cases these were nation-to-nation -nation belts, um, as citizens of nations, it's our responsibility and our obligation to live up to these uh, agreements and commitments. So I think often what happens is that as uh, Indigenous people and Indigenous scholars, um, we're working and continuing to work on that, like that, we haven't forgotten that. Um, but then as citizens of Canada, um, as institutions that receive provincial or federal funding, all of you are beholden to these treaty relationships as well, individually. Um, and so that that's a really important thing to remember. Um, I say this to undergrad students all the time, like, have you read the Constitution? Have you read the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Do you know what it means to be Canadian? Why do you have a passport? So until you know what it means to be Canadian, how can you possibly know what it means to be in a treaty relationship with Indigenous people? And that's a lot to ask, um, but it's a responsibility of being an engaged citizen. Um, and so I think that that comes into this as well, that this is about more than um, empathy, which is very important, but there's actually a responsibility um, for non-Indigenous people uh, in Canada to do that work. Hi, uh, my name's Sean. So this is a question principally for Taylor, but uh, you, others may have uh, some reflection on it as well. When I was listening to your presentation, especially with regards to the wall collection, uh, my archivist hat was saying this material should just be repatriated directly to, uh, to Six Nations. Um, and you kind of reflected a bit on the end as to why that wasn't necessar necessary from your perspective. But from a general perspective, when is repatriation appropriate and when is a pro uh, repatriation of any kind of records the right action for an archives to take? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> I think like, well, the number one thing I could think of like for repatriation is definitely if you have relatives like remains in the, your archives or like your museums and things like that. I think that's like the pri priority one. But uh, I think if there's because that collection is so huge, it doesn't just reflect on archives, but on material objects as well too. So if they had purchased, um, so the collector purchased like different objects from different families, if those families want those objects back, like that would be definitely a, like a high priority. Because like the the textbooks, because like or the the notebooks, I don't think is uh, too, like it's important, but at the same time though, like it would be good, but like. We just don't have the facility right now to house those information. Like that's where I think what Ellen was talking about with uh, financial th problems as well too. A lot of communities uh, they don't have the like the capability to house these things, and so it just takes up a lot of space and it's not being properly cared for. So again, like you could sacrifice losing all this stuff, or you just keep it there, but we need the information that comes back. So definitely like making transcripts that are available for communities, I think, are number one. Um, again, though, like. It's really tough to say, like, if, if and when, like, we are capable of taking these things in, then definitely for sure. Like, that's that's all I could think of anyway. You guys want to add something? Um, from my experience, a lot of it is repatriated when it's asked for, uh, when repatriation is requested. Uh, while I was in my uh, MA, I was working with uh, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. Uh, formerly the Museum of Indian Archaeology. Uh, did not know that when I started. Uh, <laughs> um, and some of the items in that collection were actually purchased in very unethical ways. And trying to find ways in which you can 
do justice to that item and do justice to the community it comes from is a very tr tricky thing to do, especially when there are community members who are unaware that those items had been taken. Um, but preserving them in a way that they are accessible to the community is first and foremost the, more, the most important thing. Um, so if you have something in your collection that you're like, this should really be repatriated, you can always try contacting the community in which you think it's from and ask if those materials are of interest or of relevance to that community or, um, and see what their response is to that. Um, if they don't have the facilities in, or the capability to care for those items or house those items, because some of these collections can be quite large, uh, you know, making digital digital availability is extremely important, but also just letting them know that they can access those materials whenever they need to is something that's very important because it removes a barrier and it removes a power dynamic. Um, the museum was actually in the process of digitizing a lot of pottery materials with so 3D imaging, um, as well as a lot of pipes and things of that nature that could be accessed by the local communities. Because what had happened was the original collector um, had kind of waited until the community had fallen on hard times because he had asked to purchase items before and they said no. And then when they had fallen on hard times or when they didn't have resources available, he's like, now I know you need the money, so you have to sell me those items. So a lot of, the, of, a lot of our collections, especially in museums, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that most of that should be repatriated. It's just the fact that a lot of communities aren't really there yet. And if you think that your institution has in some ways of supporting that effort or supporting the community in that way and you can kind of help um, share your knowledge of preservation or of archival standard with that community, that would also be extremely helpful. And I just wanted to throw one note of caution. Um, that's something I think we've seen at Deo Hohage is that um, sometimes material becomes digitized and uh, organizations want to create access. So they put it up online. And you should really review it with the communities first because some material is not meant for everybody to have access to, especially if it's ceremonial or sacred material, right? So really working uh, in conjunction with community to identify that is very important. Um, don't just put it up online because you're trying to do good work and thank you for doing the good work, but that, like, that knowledge is also important to have before you just put material out into the world. And sometimes people like Fenton um, did publish material that really shouldn't have been accessible to everyone, so now it's also a process of sort of, um, we, we kind of have to repeal some access, right, to some of the material. There is food. Um, I don't have a microphone here. <laughs> So we're going to take a, a break now for lunch. We're going to share some food. Um, it's next door, I believe, or just outside. I can't remember. It's not in this room. And we will return at 2 o'clock. I think it's 2. 2 o'clock. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I'm done. So I fumbled my ending. But um, I'm done. And for the rest of the afternoon, you are going to have MC Sean Smith. So thank you very much.